Versailles, the enchanted palace where all is splendor and delight, where the marriage of art and nature produce perfection. Versailles, its other face, a formidable instrument of power built by Louis XIV. The great Bourbon king moved the center of power away from Paris, as if to distance the court from the whispers and intrigues of the capital and the plots that have haunted him since childhood. Here, the king gathers all the nobility of his realm about him, under his watchful eye. Soon, more than 3,000 princes, courtiers, ministers, and servants live at Versailles. Palace, park, and garden are aligned with the sun's path. Here all is discipline, order, balance. Beyond the monumental esplanade of the Place d'Armes, the first gate opens onto the forecourt. The minister's quarters throng with petitioners from all over the land who have come to Versailles to promote their own concerns. The second gate, destroyed during the revolution, is the real entrance to the palace. It is locked by night, but by day it is open to all. Everyone has access to the king. Understandably, this freedom astonishes foreigners. Guards stand by to confiscate firearms to search carriages authorized inside the royal courtyard, and to make sure everyone is properly dressed. But everything has been anticipated. Those who have neither the means nor the right to carry a sword and hat can rent them at the entrance. People from all walks of life rub shoulders on their spectacular marble stairway that leads to the queen's quarters on one side and to the king's on the other. After the death of Queen Marie Therese, the king moves into apartments where he will live for the next 30 years. 30 years lived pitilessly exposed to the public eye. 24 bodyguards live in the guard room at all times. Four of them are assigned to protect the king from the crowd anytime he moves about the palace. Here in the first anteroom, where courtiers stroll by day, the king eats the royal meal. At 10 o'clock, he displays his royal appetite to all. Before the fireplace, the royal caterers, literally attendants of the mouth, have laid the table for the sovereign and the royal family. Lords and ladies take their places in the anteroom according to rank, in the presence of curious passers-by, astounded by the spectacle. Through the windows of the second anteroom, one can see the Hall of Mirrors. Here the courtiers and attendants wait to be admitted at the moment of the royal awakening. This room, called the Bullseye, takes its name from the curious shape of its circular window. Frolicking infants and cherubs. This frieze embodies the tastes of an aging king who demands that youth be ever present about him. A page boy silently opens the shutters of the royal bedchamber. Golden light suffuses the chamber. Slowly, the king awakens. The royal bed is protected by a gilded railing. Above the canopy, the personification of France watches over the sleeping king. Even more than the throne, the royal bed is the symbol of kingly power. The bedroom is at the center of the palace, the bed is at the center of the bedroom, and all who pass must bow before it. At 8.30, the head chamberlain murmurs, Sire, it's time to rise. The ritual unfolds. 
First, the ceremony of the small awakening, followed by the ceremony of the grand awakening. There is a constant stream of comings and goings. On an average morning, at least 100 people can be seen bustling in and out. Not only wardrobe and chamber attendants, but also bishops, ambassadors, provincial governors, and parliamentary officials who rise at dawn to be present at the Grand Awakening. One must be there to hear the news, to gossip, but more importantly, to be seen. Louis XIV has chosen the self-portrait of Van Dyck to hang above his door. High on the walls he has placed paintings by Valentin, the French pupil of Caravaggio. He likes Valentin's work, the tribute to Caesar, Saint John, Saint Matthew, Saint Mark. Once the ritual of the Grand Awakening is completed, the king meets with his counselors in the adjoining room, the official royal office. In the mid-18th century, Louis XV completely transformed this room, but nevertheless, it has always been the reigning heart of the realm, the symbol of the scepter and hand of justice. For more than a century, from 1682 until 1789, Versailles is the seat of absolute monarchy and the government of France. The king rules alone. He demands consistency and obedience from his ministers. In this room, every day he summons his counselors, signs documents and receives petitions both grand and humble. It is the place where his subjects may address him directly. But sometimes, instead of his counselors, the king summons his superintendent of buildings and his architect, because the king's ruling passion is building. Versailles was originally a hunting lodge built by Louis XIII, but it would be unthinkable to keep such a primitive dwelling as the royal residence. It must be completely refurbished, terraces built, marshes drained, nature subdued. Construction will last more than 50 years. At its height, more than 15,000 men will be employed. At first, the young king merely embellishes the existing house of cards and visits it with female companions from time to time. In the forecourt, the architect Laveau constructs the common rooms, stables to the left, kitchens to the right. The gardens, following the layout of the gardener Le Nôtre, advance at a pace. When he is 30 years old, Louis XIV tells Colbert that he wants to move his council to Versailles. This prompts the first construction to enlarge the castle. On the side facing the town, Laveau's common rooms are linked up to the castle and their facades are soon adorned with columns, balconies, statues. The original castle is literally surrounded by new buildings. The first idea is to enclose it on the park side with two lateral wings, linked by a huge terrace. The influence of the Italian Baroque villa is dominant, but the uncertain French climate makes this terrace impractical. It soon disappears. The Hall of Mirrors takes its place. Though the terrace is gone, the architecture stays predominantly Baroque. The ground floor is designed like a huge pedestal in bas-relief. The first or noble floor is adorned with columns, statues resting on cornices, flat roofs disguised by a huge balustrade bristling with urns spouting flame, and trophies. In 1682, Louis XIV makes Versailles his official residence. In only 10 years, Jules Adouin Monsard the king's new head architect, expands the building's surface five-fold. He adds two immense wings to the castle. The wing facing the park is designed for the comfort of the royal family, the wing facing the town for the discomfort of the courtiers. And of course, the middle is reserved for the royal apartments. The 
king's apartments. This, the domain of the sun, the domain of a young king who wants to dazzle the world. Solar emblems intertwine with royal insignias in an explosion of gold. Cornucopias overflow with the bounty of the great century. A wealth of marble, a brilliance of color, grandeur, light, harmony. It has been said of Lebrun, the creator of this decoration, all the arts were his servants. Marble becomes a painting, sculptures too. Just as the sun is the symbol of the king, each room is dedicated to a planet. In the middle of this room, Venus, the goddess of love. On the arch above the door, the newlyweds Alexander and Roxanne are a reminder of the glory of the king's own wedding. The metaphoric message is clear to Louis XIV's subjects. Passing from room to room is a mythological journey. Diana's Salon. Diana is Apollo's sister and the goddess of the hunt. This bust of Louis XIV is a masterpiece by Bernini, the most renowned sculptor of the time. In 1665, Louis XIV agreed to pose for this finely crafted sculpture. He was 27 years old at the time. Lorenzo Benini had the opportunity to get to know the young monarch, whose taste he considered questionable. The Italian artist thought that the French king placed too much importance on fussy detail and paid too little attention on the grand picture, the Italian style. The royal apartment shows how the king's taste evolved. In Diana's salon, there is a billiard table. Louis XIV is an excellent billiards player. Three evenings a week in the winter, between six and ten, he demonstrates his prowess before an admiring court. Mars Salon. The largest room in the king's quarters is the ballroom. Here the king's retinue danced to the sound of violins and oboes. In the middle of the ceiling, Mars, the god of war, sits in a chariot drawn by wolves. This room is situated in the line of formal rooms. Every day, courtiers and those curious to see the royal art collection stroll through it. A printed guide helps them to identify the paintings and sculptures. King David playing the harp, painted by a Dominican, was Louis XIV's favorite canvas. The Pilgrims at Emmaus by the Venetian master Veronese, one of the most sought-after artists of his time. Darius's family at Alexander's feet by the king's master painter Charles Lebrun. The message is clear for those initiated. New French painting has achieved equality with the greatest of Italian art. The automatic clock in the Mercury Salon is all that remains of the furniture from the Louis XIV period. It was a gift of the clockmaker himself in 1706. Every hour, a small statue of the king appears, and an angel descends to crown him with a laurel wreath. Originally, this room was the royal chamber. It was dedicated to Apollo, god of the sun, the only heavenly body that rises and sets. Naturally, this is the room where Louis XIV's Apollonian awakenings and reposings were acted out. Charles de la Fosse's use of color is particularly well demonstrated here. In the corners, he paints the four continents bathed in the nourishing rays of the heavens. In the arching, Vespasian builds the Colosseum. Augustus has the port of Mycenae excavated. 
Thus, Louis XIV shows the world his talents as a builder. This portrait of the king in his coronation robes, painted by Rigaud, will hang in the palace throughout the 18th century as a permanent tribute to the greatness of Louis the Builder. The message implied by the decor changes and intensifies in the war gallery. The glories of battle are no longer disguised in mythological trappings. No longer do we see Apollo, but Louis XIV himself ravaging the enemy. At the height of his reign in 1678, the Treaty of Nimeguen seals his victory in the war with Holland. Nothing is untouched by this mood of exultation. Mirrors, rare marbles, superbly chiseled, and gilded bronzes. The War Gallery, the Hall of Mirrors, and finally, the Peace Gallery. More than 100 glittering yards immortalize the majesty of the King's apartments. Most of the time, the Great Hall of Mirrors is a kind of waiting room, but sometimes it is the stage for galas given for princely weddings, or perhaps receptions for ambassadors from distant lands, who will return home to their sovereigns with tales of the grandeur of the King of France. Le Brun reserved the arched ceiling for works celebrating the greatest events of Louis XIV's reign. They revolve around a central composition, showing the great powers. In their presence, the young king turns away from light-hearted dalliance to contemplate the immortal crown. Seventeen mirrored arcades are an arrogant display at a time when mirrors are an item most can ill afford. The technical prowess of the kingdom's new factories is the envy of all Europe. Mirrors of glass inside, mirrors of water outside. Great ornamental pools lined with allegorical statues of the rivers of France typify these gardens of high Baroque style. Versailles has the most magnificent royal garden in all of Europe. Its creator, André Le Nôtre, is not merely a gardener. He is a landscape architect, perhaps the first. He transforms nature, organizes it, expands it. But Versailles is also a pleasure garden, which never ceases to amaze. Sculptures and dogs' mouths spouting water reflect the greatest pleasure of the court, the hunt. The king would sometimes give his own guided tours, setting the itinerary, where to stop to admire a particular view, when all the joy of discovery finally overwhelms the senses. The pater, exposed to sun and wind, are not really intended for strolls, but for enhancing the buildings. They can be admired from the apartments and cross to reach the orangerie. 1,080 exotic tropical trees. Orange trees from Portugal, Spain, and Italy. Lemon trees, oleanders, and pomegranates. Some of them over two centuries old. The Orangerie, with its purity of line, use of space, its 13 meter high arches, reaffirms the genius of Ardouin Monsard. Its southern exposure and double windows kept the orangerie at a constant temperature, five to eight degrees centigrade, even during the winter.
To the left, facing west, a dozen groves have been concealed in the woods that stretch to the north and south of this vast perspective. An outdoor ballroom in the bowl of an amphitheater. Delicate cascades and filigree rockwork adorned with shells. The court dances in this grove. The time is now past when the young Sun King would shine in the company of such mistresses as the gentle Lavalière or the exuberant Athenaïs, Marquise de Montespan. These enchanted gardens rang with the music of Lully, the poetry of Molière, and forged the reputation of Versailles. The secondary alleys that run parallel to the vast perspective are dedicated to the seasons, with of course Apollo, sun god, reigning from the center. The play of light and shadow, one hour melting into the next, the year melting away. God of the grape harvest, Bacchus, bales the September waters and autumn rains. Further down the path cut through the woods, the god of winter, Saturn, contemplates clouds while cherubs, the promise of spring to come, flutter about him. These fountains are made of gilded and painted lead. The gardener has created a sense of intimacy with winding paths, secret spots hidden behind trellis work. The peristyle of the colonnade is next to the Maronnier's room. Here in this space used exclusively for concerts, we see pure classic lines with sculpture, marble, water. The Rape of Persephone by Pluto by François Girardon, the king's favorite sculptor, thrusts upward from the center. This is the perfect marriage of the architecture of Jules Ardouin Mansart and the gardens conceived by Le Nôtre. At the heart of the garden, is the fountain of Apollo's chariot. The young god is drawn by four fiery horses as he rises from the dawn. He is escorted by four tritons and by four sea monsters, four of everything. The solar theme dominates in the whole garden but it's particularly apparent in the central axis. The four seasons, the four continents, the four natures of man. The light bearer creates an entire cosmology. Apollonian myth is rich with tales, his wars, his loves, his pastimes. Latona's fountain shows a scene from the gods' childhood. To flee the wrath of Jupiter's wife Juno, Latona, Diana and Apollo's mother, seek shelter in a foreign land where she is cruelly tormented by the local peasants. Desperate, she begs the father of her children, Lord of Olympus, for protection. Jupiter transforms the insolent farmers into toads and lizards. You cannot see the grove of Apollo's baths from Latona's fountain. Louis XVI would ask Hubert Robert to completely redesign the grotto of this remarkable sculptural trio, originally commissioned by Louis XIV. The 
the sun horses. the god bathing after his daily toils. François Girardon and Thomas Regnaudin carve these seven figures from the finest white marble. The huge Grand Canal. An entire flotilla sails here. Sloops, Venetian gondolas, Yachts presented by the King of England and royal galleys. And deep in the forests lie the hunting paths. As Versailles expands more and more, the King finds he needs a new country house, the Trianon. invite his family here. Both his heir, the Monseigneur, and his many mistresses' children visit him here often. Madame de Montenon, whom he had secretly married, joins them. She tells of how one summer in 1689, the perfume from the flowers was so overwhelming that the party had to flee the garden before all the ladies fainted. At the Trianon, all is organized to make the garden an extension of the house. There is only one floor. The court is seen from the garden. Inside, every angle can be contemplated through long bay windows. The gardens are visible everywhere. It is a palace of flowers. by way of the North Wing. Everything is a celebration to water. The sparkling fountains seem to shape the light around them. At the top of the Alley of the Infants, one can see the nymph's bath and the pyramid. Behind this fountain of crustaceans, dolphins and tritons, the chapel soars. It is fitting that the house of God stand higher than the house of the king. Angels bearing palms, cherubs, fleur de lis line the roof. The chapel is as luminous as heaven itself. It is the manifestation of the triumph of Christ the King. Like all Palladian chapels, it has a second floor. The pillars look like embroidery set in stone. Above them, angels carrying the symbols of Christ's passion mark the stations of the cross. This procession of pain leads to the altar just as the passion led to death before the resurrection. Death, the deposition, Christ after the crucifixion held in the arms of John and mourned by the Virgin Mary. This gilded bronze bas-relief is the masterwork of Van Cleve. But the great sacrifice is followed by the triumph of the resurrection. It is not Apollo's son, but God's son that illuminates the earth. Yahweh can be read in the triangle, the symbol of the Holy Trinity. Every day chords swell from the giant organ as the prayer for the monarch lifts heavenward. Domini salvum fac regem, God save our king.
The domed ceiling shows a sky torn asunder by the glory of a reborn Christ, master of the universe. The painting is by La Fosse. Reigning over all, God the Eternal Father by Antoine Coypel. And finally, the Dove, the third element of the Trinity by Jean Jouvenet. The Holy Spirit descends to the royal balcony with a very Christian king, the sacred king, lieutenant of God on earth, receives mass daily. On the floor below is the cipher of Saint Louis, forefather and patron saint of the monarchy. This chapel is the last construction of Louis XIV's reign. It was begun by Ardouin Mansart and completed by his brother-in-law, Robert de Cotte. It is a huge sculptural undertaking, the work of three generations of artists and workers laboring for a reign that would never end. The chapel is consecrated in 1710. Five years later, the Sun King breathes his last. Louis XIV's great-grandson Louis XV, the Beloved, painted by François Lemoine. Nothing seems to have changed. The young king, most beautiful man of the realm, is also depicted as a Roman emperor, but this time he's holding out an olive branch. Louis XV continues his great-grandfather's building projects, especially Neptune's fountain. The new fountains are extravagantly rococo and add a new flavor to the garden's aspect. But even at Versailles, change is coming. A libertine mood from Paris brings a sense of folly and intimacy. And Louis XV is a man of his time. Large spaces shrink, and here we find the king in his small apartment. The king lives in a private room now. This is where he sleeps, after enduring the rituals of awakening and reposing in the chilly formal halls of Louis XIV. In 1754, the great antechamber becomes the office of the clock, in homage to this monument of science and art. This astronomical clock shows the phases of the moon, the days up to the last second of the year 9,999, the hour, And finally, in a crystal globe, it shows the planetary movements. The molding along the ceiling is delicate and fanciful. It is pure Rococo. Throughout Versailles, elegance is giving way to daring. The king's desk is perhaps the most famous in the world. Louis XV wanted to leave his papers in disarray unseen by prying eyes. The cabinet maker, Resnaire, invented for him the first roll-top desk. It took him 10 years, and he signed it Resnaire, 1769, which is almost unheard of. The skill of the inlay is astonishing, as is the bronze work and the elegance of line the tiny statues, the attention to detail. The keyhole is shaped like a fleur de lis with a matching key showing the royal cipher. A quarter turn reveals the secret drawers.
One by one, Louis XV received his ministers in this small office. While next door, the spies of the king's secret service awaited orders to scour Europe in the sovereign's name. The metal cabinet by Gaudreau is all curve upon curve, a perfect example of Rococo predominance in the 1740s. Thirty years later, two other more sober corner cabinets were made to complement it. They held the newly minted medals of the history of the realm. As in all these perfectly detailed rooms, the carved marble of the fireplace is perfectly coordinated with that of the mantelpiece. In Adelaide's room, we find some of the best woodwork in the castle, made by Webet. Here Louis XV's favorite daughter, the third of his seven girls, studies Italian with Goldoni and the harp with Beaumarchais. This is undoubtedly where the prodigy Mozart played harpsichord for the royal family in 1763. Combs, scissors and sponge are reminders that this little room was the king's bathroom. The delicacy of these gilded designs green gold, matte gold, glittering gold, show that private comforts and pleasures were integral to this king's reign. At the heart of the castle, the stag's court opens on what looks like a stack of little rooms, the king's suite. A graceful stairway opens onto a landing that leads to the most intimate rooms, Low ceilings, undecorated walls very different from the preceding reign. The king's domestic life is hidden even from his courtiers. Surrounded by ambition and intrigues, Louis XV turns in on himself and his private life. After the hunt, he summons a few select friends for a quiet supper, regaled by brilliant conversation and France's finest cuisine. He can be free to relax in the company of friends. The king submits less and less to the stiff ritual of the public meal, and no one is ever quite sure where he is. Perhaps he is bantering with Madame de Pompadour, the queen of this little world for twenty years. The king's last great passion would be for the young beauty, Madame du Barry. Rumor has it that she is the daughter of a priest. The court is outraged when this young countess is installed with the king. 1770. The court discovers the opera house when the Dauphin, the future Louis XVI, weds Marie Antoinette. By using old plans from the Louis XIV period, the architect Gabriel conceived a long colonnade, made to look even longer by a play of mirrors. Thanks to its oval shape, every member of the audience had an unhindered view. The acoustics are perfect. Because it is made of wood, the house resonates like a rare violin. There are 1,000 seats. The orchestra pit seats 80 musicians, who play Lully, Rameau, Gluck. The king has his own box. He wants to see without being seen. Today this opera house is the largest surviving court opera in Europe. Louis XV dies in 1774. A heavy past sits on the shoulders of the two young heirs, ill-prepared to reign. Painter Hubert Robert shows the royal couple watching the felling of trees in the park. They have grown too old. Prophetic canvas. 
The statues, a symbol of a glorious past, keep watch. The present is soft and light, but an uncertain future is mirrored in these grim skies and the desolation of these dying trees. Indecisive and shy, Louis XVI is more interested in science, the hunt, and fine living than in governing. He likes to hide away in his comfortable rooms, especially his beloved library. Sculpted infants support the mantle of the fireplace. Across the front are gilded bas relief. The king is a curious man. He is passionately interested in the voyages of discovery. He traces on his globe the route of Captain Cook's journey and works on mounting the expedition of his own navigator, La Perouse. Madame Vigée Lebrun captures the natural dignity of the queen, Marie Antoinette, in this painting. Marie Antoinette detests Versailles and ridicules royal etiquette. Young and spirited, the French queen seeks diversion and pays no heed to the advice of wiser counselors. When she has to reside in the palace, she hides away with her favorites in her large apartment or her gilded salon. Resnaire, the cabinet maker, who constructed the famous roll-top desk, makes her an ensemble of furniture exquisitely decorated in bronze and fabulously expensive. Not much of a reader, Marie Antoinette almost never visits the library, designed by Richard Meek. Instead, she spends much of her time resting in her boudoir, the sofa room. Louis XVI redecorates this room for her after the birth of their first son. The Queen's favorite emblems are all there. The Habsburg Eagle, which is even incorporated into the glass in the door. The Rose for Love. The Peacock, the symbol of Juno, Queen of the Gods. dynastic glory. All the heirs to the throne are born here. Three queens have slept in this bed. The decoration is pure Marie Antoinette. Here she is in her room, surrounded by her ladies-in-waiting. The structure of the room goes back to Marie-Thérèse, Louis XIV's wife. The woodwork and the ceiling decorations were made for Louis XV's wife, Marie Legzinska. The queens had to observe the same rituals for their toilette, their meals and their sleep as their husbands. Even childbirth was a public affair. Marie Antoinette reacts violently to this practice. Her first lady-in-waiting describes how in the final moments of labor, Vermont, the obstetrician, Shouts, the queen is delivering. The oglers thrust their way into the room. There were so many of them, and they were so loud, that I thought the queen would die of fear. Untouched since Louis XIV, the ceiling in the Salon of the Nobles is dedicated to Mercury. Here the queen holds audience. This antechamber is reserved for the great meal, which now only takes place on Sunday. Marie Antoinette just makes an appearance. She doesn't even take her gloves off. Why bother coming to Versailles, people wonder. 
we never see the king or the queen anymore. In response to the increasingly virulent attacks on her, Marie Antoinette commissions this portrait. She is depicted in Her Majesty, mother to the heiress to the throne, sovereign Queen of France. But it is already too late. This picture is dated 1787, only two years before the revolution. In this climate of discord, the Trianon plays an ill-fated role. But let's back up a bit. At the encouragement of Madame de Pompadour, the Trianon had been expanded. The Marquise was the only person who could entertain and distract the difficult Louis XV. She managed to get him interested in the Trianon project, which she had worked on with the architect Gabriel. In the new pavilion with its French garden, Louis XV could keep his herbariums. There were concerts and dainty little meals. The frieze of roosters, chickens and turkeys mirrors the nearby menagerie, full of barnyard animals. Fifteen years after the French pavilion, Gabriel built the little Trianon castle to modern taste, a Grecian design. Madame de Pompadour, who died in 1764, never lived to see it completed. There is a break here with the Rococo, a movement towards classicism that can be seen in this stairwell. Its simplicity is a stark contrast to the ornate banister festooned with Marie Antoinette's monogram, a reminder that as a gift, Louis XVI has given her the Trianon. The audience room is the largest of all the rooms in the Queen's quarters. Flowers abound, lilies and roses, sunflowers, even the flowers that figure in the myths of Narcissus or Hyacinth. The queen is alone here for long, too long holidays. The lady of the manor admits only members of the royal family and a few chosen friends in her presence. Protocol is, of course, dispensed with. that have been lined with Louis XV's pride and joy. Long greenhouses designed by Jussieu. Marie Antoinette had them raised. Marie Antoinette's love of nature repeats itself in her extraordinary bedroom chairs. They were ordered from Jacob, the most daring carpenter of the day. stalks mingle with lily of the valley. Precious fabrics are embroidered with wool. Nearby, the Temple of Love with its brooks and rustic air sits in the newly constructed English garden. This little cockeyed room was created especially for Marie Antoinette. the Queen's desire to hide away from the world. Another escape, the theater. 
On this stage, Marie Antoinette acts out her favorite roles. She plays Rosine from Beaumarchais' Marriage of Figaro, which Louis XVI had banned in Paris. The house still has all its original machinery and all its rigging. Now all is silent, waiting for the curtain to rise again. This scenic decor from 1750 is among the oldest in the world. At the edge of the Trianon's domain, the architect Meek designs this make-believe shepherd's village for the queen. It has a dozen little rustic Norman houses, a farm, a dairy, a windmill, a pond, and of course, the Queen's house. It's a pastoral refuge. On October 5th, Marie Antoinette is at the Trianon when news comes that the mob is marching towards Versailles. The next day, the queen's apartment is invaded and her bodyguards slaughtered. The king gives in to the rebels, forced departure for Paris. When the king and queen were guillotined in 1793 and 1794, at the height of the reign of terror, the palace is threatened with destruction. The people cry, let them plow it under. Potatoes are planted in the formal gardens, the furniture auctioned off. In the course of the year, 17,000 lots fall under the auctioneer's hammer. The slow decline begins until the dawn comes again, for Versailles will outlive any revolution, and the fascination grows. In 1810, Emperor Napoleon I, riding here in front of the Trianon, is nourishing a desire to set up his court at Versailles. He has just married Marie-Louise, the great-niece of Marie-Antoinette, all the same, Versailles intimidates him. He prefers the Trianon and moves in. The emperor's furniture is still there, so much so that he feels more present than his predecessors. In his room, Louis XV's paneling disappears behind the bed, and the chairs are recovered in cream-colored silk embroidered with silver. But time and tide wait for no man. Five years later, with the defeat at Waterloo, the empire falls. Crowned king in 1830, Louis-Philippe does his best to save Versailles, but to what purpose? He decides to make Versailles the symbol of the nation. 1837, the palace becomes a museum, a shrine to the bygone glories of France. Louis-Philippe wants to unite the French people who have been torn apart by rival factions. He tries to appease the nobility, by consecrating five rooms to the Crusades. The dominant symbol of the main room is a 16th century cedar door that originally stood in Rhodes at the hospice of the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. It was a curious neo-Gothic touch in the Baroque and Rococo halls of Versailles. Louis-Philippe chose the most renowned painters for the canvases. Delacroix creates entry of the Crusaders into Constantinople. The former annex of the princes on the first floor becomes a 120 meter long battle gallery. 35 canvases and 75 busts are a monumental summary of France's military history, at least its victories. Clovis, the founder of France, victorious at Tolbiac in 496. Saint Louis fighting at Taibou in 1242 by Delacroix. François I at Marignan in 1515 by Fragonard the Sun. Louis XV and Marshal de Saxe at Fontenoy in 1745 by Horace Vernet. Napoleon at Austerlitz in 1805 by the Baron François Gérald. 
It is thanks to Louis Philippe that Napoleon's presence is so dominant at Versailles. There are many nostalgic tributes to the Napoleonic era. David's famous Coronation of Napoleon gives its name to this gallery, the Coronation Gallery. It has been redecorated in high empire style and houses another of David's canvases, Distribution of Eagles. The length of the suite of rooms on the ground floor of the South Wing also honors the Napoleonic era. Giraudet's revolt in Cairo dramatizes this event in the Egyptian campaign. Napoleon also appears high up on the top floor. Painted by Barangol, Napoleon in Italy rushes forward under a barrage of bullets to take the bridge of Arcola. Twenty rooms illustrate the twenty years of Napoleonic influence over the destiny of France. Thus, Versailles is the major museum dedicated to Napoleon, a museum that records the history of France from the Middle Ages to the 19th century. The palace lives on today. In its 800 hectare estate, millions of tourists can visit 120 historical galleries and 120 rooms of the royal residence. The treasures dispersed by the revolution have come home. In Louis XVI's games room, the proper furniture has found its proper place. Marie Antoinette's dinner service awaits the Queen's supper. The vast dining room is ready for a formal banquet. Louis XV's decor has been reinstalled. The new carriage museum in the royal stables displays gala coaches, royal carriages. Ancelotti's Grove has been restored to its former splendor. Throughout the estate, the original hydraulic system functions, giving life to this fairyland. thousand trees to prune and care for, 210,000 flowers to be planted every year, as well as more than 2,000 windows, 700 rooms, 67 staircases, 11,000 square meters of roof. Its splendor intact, Versailles, just as in the glorious days of the Sun King, still fascinates the world.